Hi, my name is Vic Veer, ENT surgeon, and today I want to tell you about tuning fork tests. It's mostly for doctors, but maybe some people might be interested as well who aren't doctors. And there are only two I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the Weber's test. Uh, Weber's test makes you look like a Teletubby where it sticks up like this. I'll show you a picture of a Teletubby if you don't know what that is. And the other one is called a Rini's test, which is on the side like this. And I'll go through them one by one. The first thing I should say is you're meant to be able to just about hear the tuning fork when it's very close to your ear. You shouldn't be able to hear it in front of you like this. So I see an awful lot of people whacking it against the table like that or something. If you can hear it through both of your ears like that, it's not going to work. You need to be quiet enough. And the way I do it is um, you can whack it against your knee. You can keep touching it so you can't hear it anymore. And when you can't hear it, that's when you press in the center of your skull really hard against the skull so you can actually hear the transmission of the sound so the way it works is that it's vibrating your skull and that's how your ears are picking it up so again whacking against there that's really loud i'm going to put it down a bit so i can because i can hear it from this this end here in both of my ears this way so you're going to mix mix up the results so it has to be just through vibration you can hear it some people find that quite hard uh, and you end up whacking a bit louder so they can actually hear what they're listening out for. And then you bring it down a little bit so they can go, ah, oh, yes, now I know what tone I'm listening for. Another thing you can do is press the tuning fork, although it's not very hygienic. You better clean it first, but against your teeth like that. And the purpose of that is that you're getting more direct contact onto bone through your teeth because your teeth are bone and it's connected to your skull. And so your ears vibrate. So it's a lot easier to pick it up, but you just have to clean this afterwards. So in the normal situation, when you press this tuning fork right in the center of your skull, you're vibrating both of your ears exactly the same. And the idea behind that is that both ears will pick up that vibration as sound. Now, it doesn't tell you that there is a hearing loss in any way. What it's telling you is that both ears can hear the same. So if you had age-related hearing loss and you can't hear very well and you did this, well, they would be able to hear it the same on both sides because both ears have come down the same amount. If, on the other hand, one ear is not as good as the other, that's when you see a difference with the Weber's test. So you're pressing like this. And the thing that you need to remember is that if you put this on your head and then one ear is blocked, then the vibration will be heard more on that side. So if I press like this, it's quite loud. I can hear it in both of my ears equally. And if I put my finger in my ear, it's now gone over to that side because that's just a bit of a quirk of our hearing that if you occlude one ear, the vibrations are heard more in that ear. So this is really useful in the sense that if you had a patient who has just had a traumatic injury, a car accident or something like this, and you look in one ear and you see, ah, there's blood filling up this ear. It's completely blocked off. And they say they can't hear out of this ear. Well, I need to make sure that it's just blood that's blocking their ears. Or has there been a fracture that's gone through the cochlea or through the nerve and destroyed their hearing for life? So I would press like this. And if they say, ah, I can hear it more now in this ear, Whereas previously I can't hear anything in this ear, I'm pressing there. Now I can hear it on this side rather than this side. That's a good sign because it means that just the ear is filled with blood or something like that. But if I do this and they say, no, I can't hear anything in this ear, it's all moved over to this ear. I can hear it more on this side. Then that would suggest perhaps that the cochlea has been fractured and or the nerve has been cut or something like that. So it's a much more serious injury rather than just a bit of blood in the ear. So it is useful in that sort of emergency situation when you're trying to work out in the resuscitation unit or something like that, where you don't have an audiologist around. This can be quite useful for that situation. The other way to think about it is to say, well, OK, if I press like this and there's earwax in this ear, it should go to this ear. However, if someone has cut the nerve on this side, well, then if I press like this, it will still go to that ear because that's the ear that it hears it more in. So it doesn't really tell you why you have a problem or what the problem is. It just tells you that there's a difference in your hearing from one ear to the other. So it doesn't sound like it's helping you very much. But if you actually ask the patient, okay, which ear can you not hear from? And they say, I can't hear in this ear. And then you do the Weber's test, you press like this and the sound goes to that ear. Then you can say to them, well, it sounds like that you have a what we'd call a conductive hearing loss. 
where the ear is blocked because of a, a finger in the ear or a bit of wax or a cholesterol or like a, some other problem in the ear. Or if you go like this and they say that this is the bad ear and actually the sound travels to the other side, we say, well, actually, it sounds like you've got nerve damage on that side. So, for example, some people come in and say, I can't hear out of my ear, out of nowhere. You look in the ear, it looks all right. You think, oh, I wonder what's going on. You do the tuning fork test and it goes to the other side. So, well, for some reason, you've had some nerve damage. It might be because you've got a Ramsey hunt or, you know, some sudden sensory your hearing loss or some, some problem like that. And then you'd start treatment for those things. So it is useful, particularly if you don't have an audiologist or in an emergency situation. Now, if you don't have a tuning fork test, you can just, this is a cheap man's um, or cheap person's now, a cheap person's uh, tuning fork test. Instead of using a tuning fork because you don't have it, you can just scratch your teeth like this and you can hear it on both sides of your ears. And if you did this, hear it more on that side i'm sorry i had to make that funny face. i don't know i can't help myself but anyway so that's how you can do it even without a tuning fork test but you can buy these things off amazon for between five and thirty pounds or so um and now i'm going to go on to the rinny's test which is a little bit more complicated now the rinny's test is when you press against the near the ear and also listen to it like this and it's complicated because a lot of people get this wrong so it's important that you hold it properly. You have to hold it down here at this point here rather than here because the vibrations will go. You still whack it like you normally do. So you shouldn't be able to hear it in front of you. I can still hear this now. But you need to be quiet enough so that you can't hear it in front of you. In fact, you should only be able to hear it just one centimeter away. Now, I've got a willing participant here who signed his GDPR compliant consenting process. And so this is the ear just here. And you want to put it just very close to the ear, not touching the ear at all, but one centimeter away from the ear hole. And it needs to be like this rather than like this. Because if you do this and you put it in front of the ear like that, you get weird interference patterns, some in interesting physics, if you're interested in looking that up. But you should do it like this, one centimeter away, and at the tip rather than down here or in the middle somewhere. So at the tip, one centimeter, that's where you should, a normal person should be able to hear it. And then you're meant to compare that to against the bone. So you do either, which is louder, this one or this one. And the actual, the correct way of doing this and the rather more boring way of doing this is that you set this thing off so you can hear it. And then you press it against the bone and you wait until you cannot hear it anymore. And when they say, I can't hear it anymore, then you put it in front of the ear and you can hear it and go, ah, then you know that this is louder than against the bone. Now, I should have mentioned, when you're pressing against the bone, it's important to press on a bony protuberance. So again, to my, my volunteer here, uh, most people press on this mastoid bone here, which is this bone behind your ear. Now, say, they say the mastoid tip, but that's not true because the mastoid tip is covered with muscle, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the one that comes down here. So it's actually sort of protected a little bit uh, from the outside world. So feel around for where you think is the uh, the most superficial part of bone, the bit you can get the bone uh, closest contact with. For me, it's just about here or, or here on this uh, model here. Some people have it slightly higher up, up there. It just depends on how much hair you have or how much space you have behind the ear in terms of skin. But press on that area, press quite hard. And as I said, the the, the proper way of doing it is to wait until they can't hear the vibrations like this and then put it in front. But doctors, we're a bit impatient, really impatient. And so we tend to go, can you hear that? Yes. Is it louder here or is it louder here? And if you say, is it louder here and here, that doesn't work very well because they're looking straight ahead and they can't tell what you're doing. So it's better to say, which is louder, number one or number two? number one and number two, and try not to make a big, you know, number one or number two, you know, you end up being a bit of a showman, but uh, patients love these tests. So just, just let them enjoy it. So you're pressing like this. Can you hear it? Number two, number one. And if they say you do, it, have to do it a few times because it is difficult to do this test. It sounds easy. And if you do it on yourself, it 
well, I don't know why patients have a problem. The reason why patients have a problem is that A, they don't know or understand how the test works or what this sounds like. But more importantly, patients generally have a problem with their hearing. And so it's quite hard to hear things if you've got a mixed hearing loss or complicated types of hearing loss. So this test isn't particularly good for that. But what it is good for, this Rini's test, when you're doing it on this and like this, and then you go to the other side, this and like this, is that it tells you if you can hear it better through the air like this, that's normal compared to this. But if you can hear it better through this way compared to this way, so through the bone, it would suggest that there was a blockage in your ear, like a finger jammed in there or a bit of wax or cholesterol or perforation or something like that. Then you know that, well, actually, I think I can fix this with an operation or I should look in your ear and work out why you have this problem. Now, the two together can help you work out what sort of hearing test problem you have, sorry, hearing problem you have, but it gets complicated. I would just practice saying, this is the Weber's test result. It goes to the left or the right ear. This is the Rini's test. Bone conduction or, or vibrating through the bone was louder than through the air, or bone conduction greater than air conduction, or the other way around. And then try and interpret the results. Because just doing these tests, you can't just magically work out what's going on with someone. You really do need to stop being such a surgeon and ask your patient what's going on and say, look, you know, which ear is the problem? What problems do you have? So this is just a little add-on bit of information to your history examination. And, and, you know, really a lot of us just go straight to doing tests on the, uh, uh, with the, with the audiologists, so pure tone audiogram and tympanogram, things like that. But this is useful in certain situations. And if you're at home and you're trying to work it, this out for yourself, I guess you could try it yourself but I wouldn't use this as a way of diagnosing a problem. Anyway, I do hope you found that interesting. I might do a quick video on free field speech tests. I'll have a think about that. Anyway, take care. Bye-bye.